Today's forum, top of the ticket, Ohio's, Ohio Governor's Race featuring Ed Fitzgerald is made possible with the support from the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation and Hannah News Service. Would you please join me in uh, thanking them for their sponsorship? We do keep our introductions brief so that we have more time for the discussion itself. Um, there is information in your form flyer about our candidate. I'm very pleased today to welcome a father, a husband, a public servant, a former crime fighter, and a dedicated citizen of the state of Ohio. Will you please join me in welcoming Ohio's Democratic candidate for governor, Ed Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Um, also, our able-bodied host and moderator, Carol Looper, will join Mr. Fitzgerald after his opening remarks. So again, let's welcome Mr. Fitzgerald to the Columbus Metropolitan Club, and the podium is all yours, sir. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for a very nice introduction. It's good to be here with you. Um, I'm just going to try to be brief and concise because the questions and the dialogue are uh, usually the best parts of these kinds of events. Um, I would say, uh, to expand a little bit about, uh, on the, the uh, introduction that was given, uh, the thing that has motivated me in, in my life has been public service. I've always tried to look at ways that I could improve the community, and I've tried to do that throughout my whole life. And, that really began with uh, eight years in law enforcement, first as a special agent with the FBI, then as a, as a county prosecutor. But it was also serving my local community, being involved <clears throat> in my local community of Lakewood, Ohio, um, and then the wider community, but starting out as um, a volunteer and an activist and a board member, and then eventually a city council person, uh, mayor of my community, and then uh, for the last four years, county executive of Cuyahoga County, which is the largest county in the state and, is, and makes up about 10% of the state. We faced a lot of challenges, both in my city and in my county. I'm very proud of the contribution that we made uh, and the way that we, do, we dealt with those problems. We had major initiatives in the last four years in areas that I think really made a difference for people. So things like public safety and job creation, economic development, uh, infrastructure, uh, early childhood education, and those are things that um, I hope will be my legacy as a county official. And the reason when people ask me, what was it that interested you in running for state office in the first place? It was that when I looked at the priorities of the current administration, I didn't see those kinds of priorities reflected in our state administration. Uh, I'm gonna give, uh, talk about this a little bit differently than I have in, in most speeches, but sometimes people ask me, was there ever a moment in time where I believe that we, or I was certain that we needed a different governor, and I have frequently said that when I heard Governor Kasich make remarks that the state of Ohio was doing so well that it was a miracle how great the state of Ohio was doing, that's when I, know, I knew with certainty that, number one, Governor Kasich was not in touch with the way that most people were experiencing life in Ohio, and secondly, that we needed uh, to take a different course. Now the question is, the question is, uh, as I'd like to phrase it today, uh, I want to take a little bit of a, a different take on that, is, and that is, what would constitute an Ohio that was doing so well that it was a miracle? Uh, what would be my standard for that? And I'll start with talking about the economy. Uh, everybody here, I think, is smart enough to realize that uh, during the recession, all 50 states lost jobs. The unemployment rate went up in all 50 states. When I hear Governor Kasich talk about that the economy is a miracle because we've added jobs in the last four years, he's making an assumption. And the assumption is that his audience does not realize that during the recession, all 50 states lost jobs. And during the recovery, all 50 states gained jobs. So for a governor to be running for re-election and saying that it's miraculous that in the last four years jobs have been created, every single governor presided over that situation. All of them. The question is, how are we doing compared to other states? Not whether or not during a period of recovery we added jobs. 
And the answer to that, and this isn't a political claim, this is something that's been confirmed by sources like the Bureau of Labor and using their statistics or academic institutions, is that we've been ranked 41st out of 50 states in terms of an economic recovery. 41st out of 50 states. We've had people leave the labor market. Over 100,000 people have, have left the labor market in this state. So you have people just opting out of the labor market entirely. The other question you would have to ask yourself is, although there has been some job creation, what types of jobs have been created? And the fact is that during the recession, we lost good paying and medium paying jobs, and they have been replaced very uh, but predominantly by low wage, minimum wage jobs. It isn't enough to just say, well, the unemployment rate is lower than it was before, because that applies to all states. The question is, how are we doing compared to the rest of the country and the rest of the world? And the fact is, we're trailing the rest of the country. We have had 22 months in a row of being below the national average in job creation. So the, the promise that we should hold people to, or the standard that we should hold people to, is not whether we've had job growth, because every single governor would pass that test. The question is, are we outperforming the national average compared to the way we were four years ago? You can look at almost any measure that you like. How about just GDP growth? How is our GDP growth, uh, for instance, in 2013 compared to 2010? It's lower. So if, if that's someone's definition of, definition of a miracle, I would uh, beg to disagree. To me, a state that was a miracle would have the poverty rate going down and not up. But the poverty rate in this state in the last four years has gone up. We have a situation where we now have, it's estimated, one in four children in Ohio have some level of food insecurity. They're not quite sure where or what the next meal is going to be. That is not a miraculous situation for them. Talk to anybody. I had the, I had the privilege a few weeks ago of uh, touring the, the Columbus Area Food Bank, and I've done that in other parts of the state. And you talk to them about the volume of folks that are coming in and looking for help. And it's not always the people that you might expect because poverty has become more suburbanized than it used to be. What about our finances in this state? One of the things that I take great pride in as both a mayor and as a county official, uh, I have really put an emphasis on being fiscally responsible and maintaining appropriate financial uh, reserves and financial management practices. And I've done that as a county official with an over billion dollar budget, and I did it as a mayor of the 15th largest city in Ohio. Um, it's, it's part of the way that a state should measure itself. It's part of the way that a governor should be evaluated. And one of the things, again, that the governor likes to uh, repeat is that it's been miraculous that they've balanced the budget. Again, I know that this audience realizes this, but when he says that, he is counting on the fact that many citizens take their cues about government finances from what happens in Washington where there is not a balanced budget and generally is not a balanced budget because they have the ability uh, to print money and to borrow. The state doesn't have that option. The state always balances its budget, just like, just like cities have to balance their budget. And counties have to balance their budget. And townships do. And villages do. It's not an option to do anything else. The only question is, how do you balance it? And I used to always tell people, I always thought there was a limited number of ways to balance a budget. You could either cut your expenses, you could raise taxes, or the economy could grow so much that you gain enough revenue that the, basically the budget balanced itself. So which of those approaches were used in Ohio? Well, taxes were raised. So when the governor says it's miraculous because they balanced the budget without raising taxes, it's not accurate. Cat taxes went up. Taxes on oil and gas went up. Sales taxes went up. 50% of the local government fund was cut, which resulted in a whole slew of tax increases all over the state. If you travel the state like I've had the privilege to do in the last year and a half or so, and you talk to local communities, talk to them about the way their property taxes have absolutely spiraled out of control. You know, there was a study done a few months ago by an academic institution that showed that while a few decades ago, 
property taxes only subsidized about 40 percent of the cost of education in Ohio. Now they're subsidizing 70 percent. And that's been aggravated by the fact that the state budget was also balanced by cutting funds uh, from K through 12 education. So all, all governments in the state of Ohio, uh, Ohio have to balance their budget. It's the way it was done by raising taxes, by taking money out of local communities, and at the same time, uh, actually leaving those communities off on their own and then leading to a ripple effect of raising taxes. There's a number of other areas. I don't want to go on too long in terms of what I would define as a miracle, but certainly when people ask me what's one of the primary roles that the state should play in creating a state uh, that's going to be vibrant, I always reference education. And how many people do you know that would tell you that they believe that in the last four years the state of education in Ohio has dramatically improved? You talk to somebody that's in a classroom on a daily basis. Talk to school board members across Ohio. They'll tell you that the situation has declined in the last few years. The state of Ohio dropout rate is up while the national dropout rate is down. We're doing almost nothing with some of the strategies that we know work like smaller class sizes. In district after district after district, class sizes have gotten bigger. If you look at the situation that's going on with the Reynoldsburg teacher strike, yes, they are certainly striking about wages and benefits and they have every right to do that. But they're also talking about things like larger class sizes, which we know is a factor in terms of providing effective uh, quality instruction. They're also protesting about things like an over-reliance on standardized testing, which just keeps growing and growing and growing in this, in this state. And at the same time, what the Supreme Court warned us about back in 1997, when they told us that the funding system in Ohio was unconstitution, unconstitutional, has only been aggravated. It, it was found unconstitutional for the simple reason that we should be guaranteeing every child an adequate education in this state, and the state has a role to play in that because not every school district has a sufficient tax base to provide that. And if the state withdraws, effectively withdraws from the funding system in Ohio, we will have an education system that will be a have and have not system. You will have some school districts that have an adequate tax base to educate their children, and you'll have some school districts that do not. And this is what's happening over and over and over again. I've been to school districts where they have cut virtually every single program that is not tested on a standardized test. All art, all musics, all the humanities, all of them are out the window. Who decided that this was a formula to create an educated society? And I can tell you another one of the ripple effects of that is that you've had this enormous exodus of quality teachers. This isn't why they went into the profession. They know that it doesn't work. So you've had teachers that are veteran teachers that are leaving, and you have teachers that are brand new teachers that are coming into the profession with uh, passion and energy and enthusiasm, and it is, it is being sucked out of the system by a state administration that is not only taking away resources, but is just focusing on standardization as a solution. The last thing that I would mention, there's too many issues to mention, I'll look forward to your questions. Last thing that I would mention is, it, to me in Ohio that was really going to deserve the, the title of a miracle would be one where its political system uh, was one that we could be proud of. And if you look at the political system right now in the state of Ohio, it, it certainly doesn't meet my definition of that. Pay to play is rampant in this town, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. If you talk to folks that are in the legislature on a daily basis, if you talk to people that are in the administration uh, off the record, and you ask them what kind of influence uh, do lobbyists and, and, and uh, big money interests have in this state, they'll tell you it's as bad as it's ever been. It's as bad as, it's, as it has ever been. The cost of our campaigns is absolutely out of control. It's absolutely out of control. And everybody has a responsibility to try to contribute to a system that is really a, a, true, uh, a true dialogue or discourse about the important issues. 
in Ohio. Everybody has that responsibility. So candidates have a responsibility to talk about substantive issues. They have a responsibility, which my opponent has decided uh, to abdicate, to participate uh, in open debate with your opponents. It's not just Governor Kasich. There's been a whole slew of statewide candidates that have decided that they can just uh, basically do a detour around public debate. Uh, the citizens certainly have a responsibility to study the candidates and ask important questions about their future, and media outlets have a, a responsibility as well to report about the important issues, uh, to focus on substance, so that our democratic process is uh, not just a show, but it's an actual evaluation of how we're doing. How are we doing as a state? What are our benchmarks for success? And my job as a candidate is to try to do those things. And so for the 25, 26 days I think that are remaining, we're gonna keep talking about issues that we think that are important. Issues that are important to the future of my family, my four children that are important to you, your children or your grandchildren. So I'll look, for, first of all, again, I really appreciate the invitation. Look forward to your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Please have your questions written. They will be collected and chosen. I have a whole bunch of questions. Let me start. First of all, welcome to Columbus. Sure. And welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Thank Club. Thank you. You talked about two things, jobs and education, and what you feel the current administration has not achieved. What are your specific proposals to bring jobs to Ohio and to improve the quality of education? Sure, so when we talk about jobs in the first place, one of the things I'm proud of is in, in my county, we set up the largest economic development fund of any county in the state. We created a $100 million fund uh, and in some ways it has some things in common with Jobs Ohio, but it has a couple, couple real differences. Number one is the system in terms of giving out economic development assistance to companies is transparent. Uh, sometimes people ask me, is there, uh, are there lessons to be learned from my time in the FBI in terms of the job of being governor? One of the things that I learned as a special agent with the FBI where I worked on political corruption investigations uh, in Chicago is that the worst thing that you can do when it comes to spending money in government is make that a, a secretive and, and opaque process. So the fact that Jobs Ohio was created uh, is not necessarily the problem. The problem is that the state's economic development efforts have been intentionally shrouded in secrecy, which I think is, is a bad idea. The second big difference between our fund and the state's fund is that we have a real focus on small business. Most people in Ohio work for small businesses. And the real opportunities, in my opinion, in Ohio, not that large corporations don't play a role, really the opportunities are in small business. Uh, the, the opportunities for payroll expansion come from small business. And in my conversations all across the state, what I hear over and over again, especially in smaller communities, by the way, is that they just have not heard from the state. There seems to be a philosophy that's holding sway in the state that says, well, uh, we will give enormous benefits to a few corporations, but for small companies, they get very, very, very little help. And I think that's a mistake. And in, in my economic development fund, we've specifically targeted efforts towards assistance to small business. Now, that may mean a very small loan, but if you, you don't always have to add jobs thousands at a time, you can add them 10, 15, 20, 25 jobs. It's still significant as all of that economic activity adds up. When it comes to education, we've made a couple of different proposals. Uh, one is to really have an investment in the state in early childhood education. Now, this, this should not be a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. Uh, this is just a best practice. And states that are getting their act together are doing it, including very conservative Republican states. Because what all of the experts will tell you is that if a child is starting uh, first grade and they only have a 500 word vocabulary, which some of them do in the state of Ohio, whereas another child is starting first grade and they have a 5,000 word vocabulary, that difference may never be made up. And that child, if you, if you trace why is that child in that first position, 
The answer almost always is that they did not have quality educational interaction at a younger age. So for $500 million, we could have, uh, I believe, quality universal pre-K in this state. We're one of the worst states in the country. It's only about 2% of Ohio's children uh, have access to state-funded universal pre-kindergarten. We know that it works. It's an investment that makes sense, and it's an investment that we've, that we've been neglecting. So that's on one side of the educational equation, and on the other side of the educational equation, we now know that a high school education is not good enough. Uh, if somebody gets a, is done with education in the 12th grade, and that's it, they are probably going to be tra trapped in poverty for the rest of their life. Now, are there exceptions to that? Sure. Some of them will make it out of poverty. But if you just have a high school degree, the days of somebody being uh, uh, a, a, a low-skill but high-wage worker are almost over in this country and in this state. And so we have to switch to a system where higher education and vocational education is expected, is affordable, and is the norm. One of the things I'm very proud of in my county is we became the first county in America where every single child that starts kindergarten has a college savings account that we hold in trust for them, that they can supplement, and that they can use for either vocational education or traditional higher education. We could do something like that very affordably at the state level, and we should. I know you blame the media for some issues that came up early on in your campaign that, that have been spoken of over and over, but it is the elephant in the room. There are three issues that I know that have been pointed to. One, people say, why didn't you vet your initial lieutenant governor candidate better because he owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes? Two, you were apparently with a friend in early morning hours found by the police department in a car. And the third thing that people have been talking about, um, the driver's license issue. Do you want to dispatch all of those for our audience, please? I, if you have those questions written, I hope we'll take care of it right now and right here. One, one of the things that, um, and I said it in my opening remarks, is that um, when somebody evaluates a, uh, a candidate, they should look at uh, their record, their performance in office, uh, and they should look at um, certainly how they've uh, conducted themselves. And if they've held public office before, they should say, um, are there factors that will give us a clue in terms of how this person would uh, conduct themselves in future office? And the good news is that, you know, I have been in public office of one kind or another for 15 years, and I have an exemplary record as both a city councilman, as a mayor, uh, as a county executive, and we have achieved real things and done great things. And I've conducted myself, I think, according to the the highest standards of public officials. And when you run for higher office uh, in the state of Ohio or in most states, if you run for a high office, you will certainly have people criticize you over the worst thing that they can come up with. And every candidate has to go through that. And for different candidates, it's different things. And everybody in this room could ask themselves if they went through that process, what would be the worst thing that they could say? And if the worst thing somebody says about me is that uh, I was careless about getting a driver's license renewed, um, so be it. But I think all those things have to be kept in perspective. And when I talk to voters across the state, what they're interested in is, how is my family going to be doing in the next four years? What's the performance of my local school district? And is the state helping with that, or are they hurting with it? Uh, for my kids that are going into the job market, is it a good job market or a bad job market? Are my taxes higher or lower? Is my local community able to provide the services I expect, or have they not been able to provide the services that, I, that we expect? Those are important questions. Now, these other issues certainly always get raised, but what all of them have in common is that it certainly they certainly weren't issues that affected other people or where other people were hurt or affected. Now, when Governor Kasich ran back in 2010, the, he went through the same process. And the biggest criticism that he got was that he was a director of a financial institution uh, that operated in the state of Ohio, that went bankrupt, and lost hundreds of millions of dollars in public pension money. What's more serious? 
Who was hurt by that? Was anyone hurt by that? And the answer is yes. Some people lost pension money as a result of that. To me, that's a serious issue, that if I were picking somebody uh, to be in my cabinet, let's say, and they had worked for a financial institution, made millions of dollars from the financial institution, but the institution itself had lost hundreds of millions of dollars of pension money, I would have said, well, that's a disqualification for public office. But we all get to, it's a democracy, and people get to decide what they think is a substantive issue and what's uh, basically an issue that people use to try to avoid having a discussion about substantive issues. Two substantive issues in the news recently. One is the Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. or, or not ruling, and uh, the other is legalizing marijuana. And I know that you have positions on both, and your positions are different from John Kasich's positions. Would you well, my, my position on marijuana is that was that medical marijuana uh, is uh, uh, should be we should have a process for allowing that in this state under the care and supervision uh, supervision of a physician, and uh, the vast majority of people in Ohio uh, believe that believe that and agree with me on that. Uh, Governor Kasich does not. I mean, the polls have shown that over seventy percent of Ohioans agree with that. Now, I will tell you, I didn't I didn't come to that uh, conclusion. Uh, lightly or glibly, uh, but I talk to a lot of people that have uh, been suffering with chronic pain. They believe that that is a medical alternative that they should have access to. I looked at the medical research and I read it in terms of the danger of marijuana as a, as a prescribed medication compared to other uh, uh, drugs and substances that are legal, that are more harmful. And I also looked at the more than 20 states that have allowed some form of medical marijuana and what the public health consequences have been. So I think that that is, uh, is an appropriate step uh, to take. When it comes to uh, uh, marriage equality, I just think it's a civil rights issue. And it's just, it's just that simple. Uh, I think that uh, uh, regardless of, w of whether a couple is an opposite sex couple or a same sex couple, that they should have uh, the right to uh, sanctify that relationship in the eyes of the state. And I think that's the way the country is headed. I think it's a, it's a, it's a basic civil rights issue. And I think that same-sex couples should have equal rights when it comes to housing, uh, when it comes to employment, which they still don't have in this country, and when it comes to marriage. These relationships already exist, whether people want to acknowledge them or not. And to me, it makes sense to give them uh, equal respect under the law. And I hope the governor will eventually change his mind on that. He, he briefly, for I think about two hours or so, did change his position to be for civil unions uh, after Senator Portman changed his position on same-sex marriage. And then his spokesperson came out later and said that that was, a, that was a misstatement. He actually did not change his position on that. But I think this is going to be one of those issues where years from now people will look back and say uh, there was a right side of history to be on and a wrong side of history, and I think, uh, I think I'm on the right side of history with it. When you wake up in the morning and see that the polls are showing you substantially double digit behind, what do you decide to do? What can you do about that? I know you're traveling the state. I know you're having forums because there are no debates being held. What are you doing to try and get yourself up in the polls? And what do you do to get yourself well, up every morning? Well, first, I don't usually wake up with the polls. Um, uh, so I usually say good morning uh, to my family. Uh, and we get started in the morning. Uh, my wife works at a public school district. And I, I have four children, two are in college. So the boys are out of the house. Actually, they're coming back. They have a little bit of a fall break, so I'll see them uh, maybe tonight. Um, the girls, my girls are still in high school. So that's the way I like to start my day whether the polls were good or bad. I, I do think it's important, this isn't the question you asked, but I'm gonna answer it anyway. Uh, I do think it's important to have balance in your life, and it's important to know what's important, and you keep focus on what you care about and what motivates you. And the core of my life always has been, I came from a big family with eight kids, and that's the way I was raised, and that's the way, that's the way I live. So that's, that's the center of my life. Now, politically, what I've always focused on are issues that I care about. So what I've done from the beginning of the campaign, and, and when I went into the campaign, 
Uh, I was an underdog and my chances were written off by a lot of people. And uh, I understood that. I know it's very difficult to run for the first time statewide. I know it's very difficult to run against an incumbent. It's very difficult to run against a political operation that has a lot of money. I understand all those things. Um, it's difficult to run in a state where state politics doesn't, in my opinion, always get the substantive attention that it deserves. Uh, those are all challenges. So why do people run for office when they're underdogs? Hopefully, they're doing it because they care about issues. And the issues that I talked about, education, jobs, poverty, uh, civil rights, those are things that motivate me. The last couple elections I had, people didn't think I was going to win. And we had some polling that was quite bad for us. Um, but I tried to run campaigns that engaged with people, had a civic conversation with people, and that's what I'll do up till the last minute. And whatever people's judgment is, I'll respect whatever their, their judgment ultimately is. What about fundraising? Uh, obviously, you're behind in fundraising. Anything you can do to bring in more funds? That's obviously in this state and every state a key factor in winning an election. Sure. I mean, you can write a check if you're really concerned, but I would just say, um, uh, Fair and impartial. Not, uh, Fair right. and impartial. Well, after it's over, you don't have to be impartial anymore. Um, look, uh, I've been outspent in every single race I ever ran. And if, if we have a system where the only people that get elected are the people that can raise the most money, we will really have lost our democracy at that point. And I'm not saying we're to that point yet, but the trend is not good in this state or in this country. Uh, I think the things that have happened at the national level with Citizens United uh, and other court rulings, uh, it, uh, there, it's so, there's such a willful blindness to the influence of money in politics. And I'm not saying that money hasn't always had an influence in politics. Money will always have some influence in politics. But I'm just not willing to concede that we're going to have an electoral system that's all about how much money you can raise. I mean, why not cut out the election entirely then and just go to the richest people in the state and say, congratulations, you now run the state? I mean, I was outspent four to one when I ran for mayor, five or six to one when I ran for county executive. I still was able to win because we had a conversation with people about what really mattered to them. And what we're putting our focus on in our campaign is we're trying to have conversations with people about their lives, what matters to them, and what the future of the state should be. And, uh, and it would be nice to have lots and lots of extra money. On the other hand, I'm also not beholden to a lot of special interests that have paid and are funding my campaign, and I'm proud of that, too. Last question. Uh, I know you were in, last question from me. I know you were in the short north, and there was a disappointing number of people, and there aren't a lot of attendees here today. Does that discourage you? No, you will not discourage me by any of your questions. Uh, I, I, look, my, what I would just say is this. Um, we have a democratic process. Everybody has a, uh, a role to play. The media has a role to play. Citizens have a role to play. The candidates have a, a role to play. Uh, that's just the way that our process works. And citizens have a responsibility to stay, stay involved and, and stay informed, and I hope they do. Uh, but I've certainly, I've been involved in politics for 20 years, and I've been to candidate forums uh, for county office where there were more people on stage than there were in the audience. That's just the way the system works. One of the things that I do think that our political system has to adapt to is if you talk to people under 30 especially, they're increasingly not even getting their information in traditional ways. They don't typically go to candidate forums. They don't read a local newspaper. Uh, they don't necessarily watch television news. They're getting their information in different ways. One of the challenges, not just for my campaign, but I think for the democratic process in general, is how do we engage younger people as people get their information in different ways? And if we fail to do that, again, we're going to have the we're going to have the form of of democracy without really the substance of it. Thank you. We have questions and. Uh... Those who have the questions will have written their names, so. Sure. 
Yes, hi, we have a question from audience member Lucanne Green. She'd like to know your position on the state of criminal sentencing and particularly on the role of community corrections. Well, I've been supportive of uh, community corrections solutions. I've never thought, and I can say this as somebody that was in law enforcement and was a prosecutor for years, and our county runs, I, I think it's the largest jail, it's not a prison, but the largest jail in the, in the state in Cuyahoga County. It doesn't make sense for people that are, that are nonviolent offenders to be in uh, correctional facilities that are, are high cost and high security. Uh, so there's a real financial uh, uh, issue at work there. And we also have to make sure that when a person is, is sentenced uh, to a correctional facility, we have to keep in mind, we're not locking that person up and throwing away the key. They're coming back into society, most of them, at some point. So the whole theory that once somebody was prosecuted and convicted, that that was the end of the story is not true. Because if you take somebody, let's say, that's 22 years old and has had a criminal record, you send them away to prison for five years and you let them out, they're coming back into society. And we have to make sure that they're ready to reintegrate into society economically. And I don't think that that's happening. Now, I do believe that the efforts the last few years to privatize the prison system in Ohio has been a mistake. I think it has a bad record all across the country. I think what's been done with the food service contracts, for instance, in Ohio in terms of privatizing them has been an absolute disaster. That's been documented over and over again. You've had an increase in the number of assaults in prison. You've had an alarming, alarming increase in the number of escapes from prison. So I think there's things that we need to be doing to improve our prison system. And the answer is not always to not send somebody to a correctional facility. Some people should be. So one of the things that I've learned in the last couple years, if you talk to local prosecutors, they've been frustrated that some individuals that may technically be a nonviolent offender, they don't have the ability to send them to prison anymore when they should. So for instance, somebody that might be uh, a heroin dealer has the presumption now of not going to prison in many circumstances when many prosecutors believe they should and I believe that they should. So I think uh, the efforts towards community corrections solutions in general are a good idea, but I think they need to be done with a little bit more forethought and they shouldn't be done strictly to try to save the state money. All right, our next question comes from audience member Mindy Wright, and she um, asks, Ohio touts growth in jobs, but it's unclear if that growth is resulting in jobs um, that provide workers, especially women, with sustainable living wages for their families. What plans do you have for ensuring that people who work can support their families? Sure. Well, it's not only is it not clear, I'd say objectively it is not true that the jobs that are being created are mostly jobs that you can actually raise a family on. Uh, the economic data has come back and it is not good. What it shows is that the jobs that we lost during the recession were mostly good paying jobs and medium wage jobs and the jobs that we're adding are overwhelmingly low wage jobs. It, it's, why, it's why Governor Kasich and I speak such different languages when we talk about the economy. If you dumb down the discussion to just say, well, we added jobs in the last four years, therefore our economic policies are working, it assumes that nobody in the electorate or nobody in the media is gonna say, well, wait a minute. How many jobs did we add compared to how many we lost? Well, the answer is that whereas the country as a whole has added back all the jobs that they lost, the state of Ohio is over 100,000 jobs below what we had before in terms of just numbers of jobs. If you ask what, uh, what type of jobs are they and what wages do they pay, the answer is, again, the economic data is back on that. The, the answer is that they are mostly low wage jobs. So what kind of policies should we be looking at? One is, I'm a big believer that if somebody is working, they should be paid a decent wage. And I don't think our minimum wage is adequate and I think we should increase it. And the fact is that when it comes to women, about two thirds of our minimum wage workers happen to be women. Many of them are the sole supporters of their families. 
and we are not honoring their work by ensuring that they are paid a decent wage. So one of the things that I've always thought is ironic is when some conservatives decry the fact that more people are on food stamps. Well, one of the reasons so many people are on food stamps is because they're also working, but they're not making enough money to actually support themselves. As a, as a CEO said to me earlier this year, he said that he was for an increase in the minimum wage, and I said, well, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that. And he said, no, my customers can't afford my products anymore. What, what any study of history will teach us is that economic growth in and of itself is not enough. If your economic growth is distributed in such a way that you have the top few percent that are doing phenomenally well, whereas middle class families are suffering and are sliding back into poverty, and more and more people are low wage and minimum wage workers, your economy as a whole does not grow as much as it should. And women have found themselves on the short end of the stick when it comes to that. I, I'd also would support, there have been some, there's been some state legislation that's been introduced to, to, uh, to introduce a, an equal pay for equal work uh, standard in Ohio, and I'm supportive of that, which Governor Kasich is not. The next question is from audience member Albert Gable. He says, the economy of the U.S. has been grown on progressive taxation. Ohio's inheritance tax has been, has been ended. The Ohio income tax has been cut, and Governor Kasich's goal is to end it by 2016 if possible. Um, how would you reverse this? It assumes you agree with that. How would you reverse this is the question. Well, I believe in a progressive tax system, uh, and I think there are a lot of reasons why progressive taxes make sense. Because if you have a regressive tax system, if you have a flat tax system, I think it overly penalizes those who can least afford to pay. And our progressive tax system was set up in the first place so that those who had profited the most by our economic system would make the biggest contribution as a percentage share of their income. And we're moving away from that now. And we're moving away from it, by the way, without really having a discussion or a debate about it. So in other words, in 2010, when Governor Kasich is running for election, he certainly did talk about the fact that he wanted to eliminate the income tax in Ohio. Well, if you ask the average person, you stop them on the street and say, would you like to pay less in income taxes? They'd say, oh, yes, I would like to pay less income taxes. That, that's a no-brainer. The question is, how do you pay for that? How do you pay for that? How is it that this state in the last few years has been able to afford to cut income taxes? Because what wasn't disclosed back in 2010 was that there was a price tag associated with that. Governor Kasich did not disclose that he was going to raise sales taxes. He did not disclose that he was going to raise the cat tax, the commercial activities tax. He did not disclose that he was going to uh, raise taxes on oil and gas. He did not disclose that he was going to cut education sp spending, which forced local property taxes up. He didn't disclose that he was going to cut the local government fund by 50%, which again forced local taxes up. He didn't tell people he was going to take the homestead ex exemption away from certain senior citizens, which resulted in taxes, property tax increases for them. He didn't disclose he would eliminate the 12.5% state share of new property taxes, which caused people's net property tax on new levies to go up again. What all of these things have in common is they are all flat taxes, regressive taxes. They are not taxed according to people's ability to pay. First of all, I don't think it was a, a, an entirely honest campaign to promise a tax cut without ever saying how you're going to pay for it. And we've never really had a dialogue in this state about how do we want to tax people? Because it's a question of what taxes do you want to pay? Why are income taxes terrible, but apparently sales taxes and property taxes are great? I disagree with that. Because there are a lot of people that are really struggling to even stay in their own homes. If you take a senior citizen, for example, whose property taxes have gone through the roof and now pays higher sales taxes, they might have been on a pension where they weren't paying income taxes. So they got no tax cut at all. Whereas the economic benefit for both the inheritance tax and the income tax cuts overwhelmingly went to the folks that were already doing well in the recession. And when you have a recovery, which is a two-tier recovery, you don't want tax policy that's just aggravating that situation by giving more and more benefit 
to those who have already made it through this economy while neglecting those who have not. Several of the audience members brought up uh, the topic of the poverty rate that you noted in your comments, and they're curious to know if elected, what specific policies would you implement or change? What specific uh, activities of state government would you direct to try to address the poverty rate in Ohio? Well, I think that any, any real discussion, intelligent discussion of poverty has to recognize that there are, there are multiple factors involved in why we have persistent policy or poverty in different parts of, of the state. And it's different, urban poverty is a little bit different than rural poverty, for instance. But it's, there are multiple causes for it. So I would just say that in general, part of it, uh, part of my strategy would be short term and some is long term. So on the long term side of it, we know that there's a causal relationship between rates of poverty and education levels. And the fact that uh, we have education uh, districts, edu uh, school districts in this state that are chronically unperforming is certainly an issue. But we're not going to improve their performance by requiring more standardized tests. We're going to do it by providing resources like early childhood education. I mean, early child childhood education makes sense just in the realm of education, but it's also an anti-poverty strategy because it gets children on a path uh, to learning in the first place. Making higher education is certainly a great policy just when you talk about education, but it's also an anti-poverty strategy because we know that the higher level of education that someone attains, the more likely they are uh, to get out of poverty and to get into the middle class or even do better for that. So the fact that we're starving those kinds of strategies I think is a mistake and we need to invest in those things. Um, when it comes to job creation, uh, again, in my county what we focused on is when we give assistance uh, to corporations, we insist that they actually create jobs that you can raise a family on, living wage jobs. We, there, there are instances in this state where we have subsidized corporations that not only don't create living wage jobs, actually cut jobs at the same time that they were getting state assistance. So it makes sense to me for all of our strategies when it comes to business development to say, we'll certainly help local businesses, but they have to be committed to creating a certain number of living wage jobs. So it's a complicated prom problem. There's a lot of different factors, but that's a couple things that the state could start doing. I'm told we have time for one more question, please. All right, this question comes from Joey Thomas. Our present governor established a faith-based initiative. Would you include such an initiative if you were elected governor? Well, the, the faith community is, is part of the mosaic of of Ohio and when you put together an administration um, at the state level you need to make sure that everybody is on board and you look to all of the talent that is in the state of Ohio and you say how do I include all of those different elements that are out there in the state of Ohio and get them on board working um, on those problems where we can find common ground. One of the things I'm proud of in my county administration is that we have done that. So we have worked with the faith community locally on social issues and economic development issues. For instance, going back to the previous question, when we had a summer jobs program, we wanted to make sure that those summer jobs were getting out to the people that were most in need. And we worked with local representatives of the faith community to make sure that that happened. And so it's not a question of what denomination are you in or whether or not there's a separation of church and state. You need to build a partnership between the public sector and the private sector and the nonprofit sector, and that includes the faith community. No matter what your denomination is, if you're a person of goodwill, if you have resources and, and networks then you can, where you can work with us uh, in, in ways to improve the lot of the average Ohioan, you'd be welcome in my administration. Not only would you be welcome, I think that every governor has a responsibility to include everybody, and that includes uh, folks from the faith community. I want to thank you, and thank President you. Jane, Scott, we'll take over from here. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. Very meaningful and uh, very well done. Thank you both. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation out in the lobby with uh, coffee and cookies. We also would remind you that this forum has been videotaped and will be uh, uh, aired on CTV Columbus Television, WOSU and its PBS affiliates and statewide through the Ohio Channel and also on YouTube. 
I will tell you that the Metropolitan Club will be embargoing all of the forums on the candidates until they are all finished on October 28th, so uh, don't be disappointed if you can't find them right away. Uh, in fairness to all of our candidates, we'll release them at the same time. Uh, once more, we're very grateful to the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation and its representatives and to Hannah News Service for uh, providing us the funding to, to do these forums and very, very grateful to uh, Ed Fitzgerald and very capable moderator Carol Looper. Thank you all for being here and thank you to our, our, um, our uh, candidate and our moderator.